All right, so our final uh, data jamboree is that the the noun to a, a jamboree or jamborees? Anyways, it's going to be Sam. Uh, Sam uh, Sam Tyner Monroe is a data scientist with a passion for R, the R language. She's the co-organizer of R Ladies Washington D.C. and a certified tidyverse trainer. Uh, before becoming a data scientist at a law firm, Sam earned Sam earned a Ph.D. in statistics from Iowa State University and worked as a statistician in government and academia. So thank you, Sam, for uh, doing this in R, uh, take it away. Yeah, um, I think I got the easy job because um, now you know the questions really well and I just get to show you code. <laughs> um, so the, the way I, I uh, thought about uh, this problem was a little bit differently, I think, than the other two folks um, did. So I read the, the questions and I kind of, I tried to sort them a little bit. So. I, I split it up into different sections. So like we have a get the data section uh, and a data cleaning section and an exploratory data analysis section, and then a mapping section and a model fitting section, which as you saw um, <laughs> from the previous speakers is very boring because there's not a lot going on um, model wise that you can do. Um, but I just, I thought I'd start off with um, just a little introduction, just a, a little bit about myself. Um, I really love R. I've been using R for 10 years now. Um, it was my first computer language, um, and I love it because I can do just about anything I can imagine in it, um, and I love R because I can solve a problem multiple ways in it. Um, that first thing might be unique to me uh, about R, but the other two things aren't unique to R. Um, so, as you saw with, um, you know, Python, Julia, you can do lot, all of these things um, lots of different ways. Um, and so... One of the things when I when I teach R or I, I give talks on like ways to do things in R um, is I always um, make my frame of reference uh, very uh, clear. So I'm I'm doing the tidyverse way of doing things, um, and that's just one way of doing uh, data science in R, um, and it's just a way that I really like. I really enjoy. Um, I'm an expert in it. You know. Uh, and so that's how I'm doing this analysis. And so just a, a caveat there that it, this is, you know, the very specific tidyverse way of doing things. And that, again, R is great because you can solve a problem multiple ways. Um, so I'll start off with just the packages that I'm using for this analysis. So uh, it's tidyverse, of course, um, tidy models, although I think I only use one function from tidy models. Um, and then the other four are for the plotting and the mapping. Um, which are pretty cool. Uh, that's probably my favorite thing about R is all of the pretty pictures that you can make. Um, and so first up, we have the, the data. Um, I used read underscore CSV from the read R package, um, and it prints off uh, sort of a, a nice little summary here for you. And uh, some things are read in as characters, some things are read in as doubles, and uh, some things are read in as times. Um, and so you can also, as you are reading the CSV, you can also specify the types of columns, um, but uh, read CSV is pretty smart about what the columns are. Um, there was also this income data that was included um, that I had to uh, download and read in uh, CSV. And there's um, a whole big, um, there's a whole bunch of columns that just read them all in as characters. And then this is something to note for later. The column names of this thing are kind of strange, um, and so we'll sort of re recode those later on. Um, I'm going to skip looking at the data because we saw that from um, Doug and Dan and Josh. Um, so we'll skip over that. Um, but this is what I'm talking about with the the column names from the income data. So census, when you um, if you work with census data a lot, and I happen to for my work. Um, you, you'll see the variables come come back at you like this. Um, there's ways to avoid that in R. Um, you can use the tidy census package, um, and you'll get a lot of this. Um, a lot of this is tidied for you. Um, but so I spend some time um, tidying it as well. I think I'm probably going to skip that part of it. Um, but again, all the codes up on my GitHub, which I dropped the link in the chat. Um, but just because there is so much and I do only have, you know, 25 minutes. Um, so again, crash data, a few things um, I noted when I first started looking at this data, which other folks also noted. Um, we have a lot of borough missings. Um, the latitude and longitude also have a lot of missings. Uh, zip code is a number, but it should be a string. 
there's, you know, some weird, you know, street names, um, the date variable is not a date object. Um, and so then I get to um, my first uh, task, I guess, which is the, um, the frequency table of number of crashes by burrow. Uh, and what I did here was I used the janitor package. There's this uh, table function, which when you give it one variable, it uh, counts it up for you and gives you the percent. And if there's missing, it also gives you the valid percent. So you can see that over a third um, of the crashes did not have a burrow provided. Um, but then if you ignore those, the most uh, bur the borough with the most crashes is uh, Brooklyn. Um, I also looked at the location. Um, you can see a lot of that is missing. Um, and then I was gonna, uh, I had this idea that maybe we could fill, uh, I could fill in la uh, the bit missing borough information with latitude and longitude using some um, geocoding stuff. Uh, but I didn't end up getting there. Um, again, this was a, a huge, a, a huge uh, assignment for just a short period of time. Um, so here's some code where I tidied up some things. Um, one of the things I like about the tidyverse is you can sort of string things together um, pretty easily. You can do one operation to a zip code, and then in the next line, you, that's there and available for you um, to modify again. So first, um, I turn and as I said, I work with a lot of census data, and so I sort of have some default things that I do um, for things like zip codes. Um, so I automatically turn everything um, to a character, and then I will make sure that everything has five digits in it, and I always use this little um, code snippet to pad a zip code, just in case. I don't think um, there were anything with leading zeros in this data set, but I just always have this when I'm dealing with zip codes. Um, and then I you know, did a little bit of tidying. Um, all of the street names, I just wanted to make them look all lowercase, look nice. I didn't end up using them at all. Um, and then I made the the hour variable that we were asked um, to make using the Lubridate uh, package and then using the um, parse date function, which is in the read R package. Um, I turned the crash date into an actual date variable um, using the, the format. Uh, okay, and then next we were asked to check um, and then again this is why I put this in this section of like it's like a data cleaning type of thing and so um, we're checking that you know this variable which is the total number of persons killed um, is actually what the data says it is and so how I did that was I just created um, a new data set called deaths where I only got um, the collision ID and then the um, variables that had the word killed in them. Um, that's another thing these select helpers in um, the tidyverse are really powerful when dealing with sort of unwieldy um, column names like this. And then so I, I did the row wise operation so that it's summing across the rows, the number of pedestrians killed, the number of cyclists killed, and the number of motorists killed. And that's um, this new total persons killed. And then I have another variable where I check um, if the number of persons killed, which is the variable that came with the data set, uh, is equal to the total persons killed. And so that's uh, my deaths data set. And then I'm counting up the match variable. And we're seeing that there's only one uh, mismatch. And I just pulled that out um, and saw that it was this um, collision ID and it, there was recorded um, and a person killed, um, but there weren't um, any uh, people killed in this um, in these columns. Um, so then I joined the data set with the total persons killed variable back into the original data set. Um, I just used the collision ID and total persons killed of the deaths variable because um, I already had the other ones and I just um, left joined them and um, you can see it automatically um, chose to join by collision ID because those were that was the only column name that matched across both data sets. Okay, um, I'm, like I said, I'm going to skip the census income data. Um, like these column names are like a whole mess. Um, but if you work with census data, it is kind of important to think about like how they're encoding information. Um, because one variable that they have is actually like the estimate of the number of 
households of one race and that race is white. So, right, there's actually a bunch of information being encoded in just that one column, um, but that's just how census does it. Uh, so I'm going to skip over this section and I'll hop over to the exploratory data analysis section. Um, and here's where we get to one of the other things we were asked to do, which is the bar chart of crashes by hour. Um, and so I just used my clean January 2022 data, um, plotting the hour. Um, and I always like um, bar charts to be white with black outline. That's just something I always like. And so I just did that. Um, and then I added my breaks so that you can see each hour of the day. And then you can see that the highest bar just barely is um, between 3 and 4 p.m. Uh, and then I looked at the persons killed by the contributing factors, and this um, I sorted. So this is, um, I just, we had to first, we had to um, lump the um, variable into and collapsing all of the, the contributing factors that had less than 100 observations. And so I did that with this uh, fact lump min function. Uh, and that is from the four cats package, which is a part of the tidyverse. Um, so you pass it the uh, the name of the variable, and then how many observations need to be in there in order to qualify um, as their their own separate category. And so then you can see down here we get other. So everything that's not what you see listed here um, is listed as other now. And that was just that. One line, um, that one little function. So I really like the the forecast package for stuff like that. Um, and next, what I did was I counted up um, that new factor variable that I made, and I weighted it according to the total persons killed. And then I sorted it so you can see which um, contributing factor had the highest first. So you can see that the ones with death are uh, unspecified, which um, again, that was strange because it was unknown, unspecified, missing, what's the difference between all of those things. Um, alcohol, failed to yield right of way, uh, unsafe speed, driver and attention, driver and experience or other. Um, and then I looked at deaths by borough, again, very similar. Um, I first we had to create that zero one variable where um, it was one if there was any death and zero if otherwise. And so I did that with a mutate um, pretty easy there. Um, so I just looked at is the number greater than zero? And then I made it a number um, because one is true and, and zero is false in R. Um, and then again, I did the same thing, counted it, weighted it according to death, and then sorted it. Um, so you can see Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, and Manhattan all had um, fatal crashes. Uh, and again, uh, we were asked to do a chi-square test. Um, I used uh, the infer package because um, I am obsessed with all things tidyverse, tidy models, et cetera. Um, and so I used that. And so I just filtered out all the instances where the burrow was missing and did death by burrow. And then we did I did a chi-square test. Um, and you can see it gave, gives a warning, which is helpful because um, as many people have stated, um, statistically, the assumptions aren't met there. Uh, next, uh, I aggregated the data to the zip code level. Um, again, that was as simple for me as just counting up by the zip code. So how many times does a zip code appear? Because um, each row is a crash. That's you're counting how many crashes are in each zip code. Um, and then connecting the zip code level data with the census data. Um, so that was as simple as just doing a little bit of renaming because I had uh, made this data set, which was a subset of the income variables um, with the column name zip. So I just renamed it um, to make it easier and uh, joined it by zip. So I did an inner join here um, because I wanted only the zip codes that one were in the, the um, census data and only the census data zip codes that were in the um, the crash data. Um, and the reason I did that is because there's a lot of zip codes that are valid for the US postal system, but not valid for the census. Um, and I won't go into all of that, but I do work with census data a lot. And so I know a lot about <laughs> zip codes. Um, 
yeah, so then that's what that looks like. So we have the zip code, the number of crashes, and then all the other variables. Um, and you can see I attempted to do some sort of um, tidying of the names of everything there. Um, okay, and so next we get to the fun part, which is the visualizations. And so first we were asked to animate the crashes over time. Um, I ended up doing quite a bit for this. Um, so first I only took the crashes with valid latitude and longitude data. Um, we, we saw earlier um, with our keynote speaker that there were several with a, um, an invalid um, latitude value and several missing. So I just took the ones that were valid. And then I just selected a subset of data that I thought I would need for the visualization. So date, time, borough, zip, latitude, longitude, and then I also got the number of persons injured and the number of persons killed, and then the death variable that we created as well. Um, then I used um, this get stamen map function, which is from the GG map package. So what that's doing is that's getting me this static map background that then I can put a ggplot on top of. Um, so that's what I'm doing there. And then um, I had to, my idea for my animation, which I took, I think I took the question a little too literally <laughs> when it said animate. And so I said, okay, well, each crash there's, it's recorded down to the minute. So I'm gonna record every minute <laughs> in the month of January in 2022. And then I'm going to plot all of the minutes and then there will be dots appearing on the map when there's crashes. Um, and so what I did for that was I made this function where um, I basically had to take the date and the time of the crash and turn it into like a really nice um, date time variable so that I could use that for my plotting and my animating. Um, so I did that and then I made a data set which I called every minute. So that basically takes the earliest crash and the latest crash and creates um, a vector of every possible minute um, in between that time period. Um, and then I created something called minute data where I have the minute and then I did a full join of the latitude and longitude data by um, where minute is equal to date time. So I'm taking that date time variable that I created um, of the crash data, and then I'm joining it to this minute, this every minute um, data. So what, what I end up with is a data set that has every minute uh, of the day and every day in the month of January 2022. And then sort of when there's a crash in that minute, you have some additional crash data and then everything else is, um, is missing. So then um, I had to use this fill function um, for the animation. So basically, um, I wanted the points to persist uh, once they were plotted. And so I filled the lat long in down so that it would stay the same until there was the next crash. Um, so that point would stay there until the next crash happens. Um, and then I also made this uh, variable called severity. So I created it um, to have three levels of deaths, injuries, and no casualties. So then I can visualize that aspect of the data as well. And then here is the code for my animation. Um, so I have my little static background map that I'm plotting um, each point of the minute data, uh, longitude, latitude, and then I'm coloring it according to the severity. So injuries, deaths, or no casualties. And then I picked some colors for those points. Um, so there are orange points, which are the injuries and red points, which are the deaths. Uh, I did a few things to uh, theme, um, to make it prettier. And then this is the animation code down here. So this is the um, GG animate package, which is really great for um, animations in R uh, on top of ggplot. So basically all you have to do is tell it how you wanna change between um, different images. So it, it basically treats it as almost exactly as what the, the Julia thing was doing, where it's just like taking static maps and just m repeating them over and over and over again for different values. Um, so it's making one map for every minute. And then on entering, you know, the, the size is bigger. And then when the minute passes, the crash gets left behind 
as a little gray dot. So as you can see in this animation, there's a big dot when the crash happens and then a little dot will be left behind in its place. So then by the end of this animation, which I've been talking for, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes now, and we're only at uh, January 3rd. So this took about an hour um, to compile on my system. Um, and it'll take a, a really long time to run all the way through the animation as well. Like I said, it took it very literally, didn't really think it all through. Um, but yeah, and so then this last bit here is um, essentially using uh, like glue to uh, access the, to, to or to um, formulate the, the, the frame time. So the, the variable um, that you give here and internally in GG Animate gets created um, as this internal variable frame time. And so then all I'm doing is formatting that frame time in some nice like human readable stuff. Um, so that's just um, strip time if you're interested in more about learning more about how R handles dates. Um, and then I populated this animate um, function. So I just said, okay, animate my plot that I just gave you. Um, and then I want one frame per row. So I want one frame per minute of the data. And then uh, at the end, pause it for five frames. So that's what that's saying. And then I'm saving it out. So this is the bit that took about an hour on my computer to render um, because it is rendering um, like 44,000 frames. So yeah, like, like I said, not, not super well thought out, but you get this super cool uh, animation and you can see the time tracking up here. Uh, and then, so then you get to see the points popping up um, with that. Okay, I'm running pretty low on time. So I think I'll do my last map um, and then I'll skip the um, the GLM bit uh, because like both of uh, Josh and Dan said, uh, there's only 17 points of interest. So it's not super interesting to model that because you don't have enough data to figure out what's going on. Um, okay, so first I used um, this handy dandy um, Tigris package, which uh, gets from census the uh, shape files for each of the zip codes. Uh, and so to do that, you have to give it um, the zip codes that you want. And so I just gave it, uh, I said, get all of the zip codes um, that start with the same three digits um, that are in my data that I have, um, just because I wanted to be like a full, a full coverage um, area, just in case not all of the zip codes were in our data. And so then I joined that um, with the, um, the zip code count data from earlier. Um, so I just said um, zip is zip code and then crash count was N and I did a left join um, because I wanted to make sure that I had all of the zip codes plotted on the map, but they might not necessarily all have crash data. And then I had to do this little tricky transformation thing um, so that the projection of the map was correct um, to be used with the plotting function, um, which is leaflet. And so here is the map that I made and I'll sort of go through that first before um, I go through the code. So it's interactive. Um, you can see the red areas are um, the areas with the most crashes. And then I believe the, yeah, this is the one with the highest number of crashes. So 1127, um, I did look it up. It's in Brooklyn somewhere, but you can now, you can zoom in and you can see like, if you are familiar with New York, I'm not, but Dan might be. He might know like what's going on in this neighborhood to make it have so many crashes. Um, and then like the, the purple areas are where there are the least crashes relatively. Um, and then you can sort of, it, it interpolates all the way through. Um, so then, so this is all done in the, these are all uh, leaflet functionalities. And so there's this color quantile function. So I just um, told it to do 10 quantiles, AKA deciles. Uh, of the crash count. And so that's going to give me a function that will spit out a color given a value of the crash count data. And then I have some nice labeling here. So that's what's giving me when I uh, zoom over a zip code, it's giving me the name or the, the zip code. And then it's saying how many crashes there are in January of 2022. And then um, leaflet, um, I just pass it the, the data that I wanted to use. And then this gives me the background that I like. Um, this is my favorite leaflet background. 
Um, I don't know if anyone else has one they like better. I'm open to that. Um, and then I'm doing this is what's drawing um, the shapes here. And so a lot of these are like your typical like ggplot um, AES things. So like the color of the lines, the weight of the lines, you know, how precise am I drawing those lines, um, the opacity of everything. And then the fill color, I just use that um, color palette function I created and then the crash count variable. And then I'm highlighting it so that when I hover over it's highlighted in white instead of in gray. So it's easier for me to see. And then I'm just labeling it. And then I'm just adding the legend down here. Um, that is one thing that I really like about ggplot is that you don't have to manually add the legend every time. It just automatically does it for you. So you hardly have to have to think about adding, adding the legend. Um, but yeah, that's it. And I think we'll stop there if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, there are a couple questions here. Uh, one person, Anna, is asking um, if there are good alternatives to the ggplot package for creating plots. Um, I, so I went to Iowa State for my PhD, which is where Hadley Wickham went. Hadley Wickham wrote ggplot. Um, we had this one of the same advisors for our PhD. And so I only use ggplot. <laughs> Because that's just what I've been using and learning for 10 years. Um, I, I don't even know how to plot in other packages or other formats. Um, the, if you're doing map stuff specifically, I think there's a, um, like a quick map package or something like that. Um, that's a good one. But yeah, unfortunately, given my limited knowledge base of plotting and that it's all ggplot. Yeah, sorry, I can't be much help there. <laughs> Just right. So Anna followed up saying she usually uses ggplot for her nice illustrations, but she's not a fan of the syntax. So just curious if there was something else. I mean, there is just the base plotting if you're doing something quick. Kind of it depends on your how you first learned, but sometimes that can feel faster. I think for some people, so that could be one other option. Um, let's see. Someone else is asking. Julia is faster than R in Python when it comes to executing code. That are involved with animate. Oh, maybe this is a question. Is Julia faster than R in Python when it comes to executing code that's involved with animations and graphs? That I don't know if that's a question for you, Sam, or maybe that's for jo Josh. I don't know. I haven't used Julia in probably about seven years. So I, I don't know. Maybe that's a Josh question. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen so we can we can all chat here. So I'll just say a quick thing. So Julia tends to be really good for code that you have to write yourself. Uh, if you're using stuff that's just kind of like a black box solution, you're probably fine with Python and R because most of the time under the hood, you're just calling C or Fortran anyways. Um, so if, if you need something or want something that's, you know, Julia all the way down uh, or one language all the way down, then Julia is good for that. Or if you're writing your own code, that needs to be fast. Uh, but yeah, if you're just using some black box solution, you probably won't get a, a bunch of huge speed ups in Julia. The, oh, someone I mentioned lattice. Yes, that's a, another way to do things in um, plotting in R. And oh, bokeh. Yeah, Dan mentioned uh, that at the bokeh. Bokeh. How do you pronounce that, Dan? Do you say bokeh? Uh, bokeh. Bokeh. It's, See, like, I, it's like the photo photography blend, like the the circles you get yeah. from out of focus light. Yeah, we used it in the grad school. I, there's a lot of words that I'm realizing I like don't know how to pronounce. For example, I always say netlify, which I think it's saying netlify. <laughs> I like don't hear them out loud first and then it's stuck in my head is the wrong way. Anyways, let's see. Um, oh, Anna's excited about that. She said that looks really good. Well, good, good suggestion. Glad that uh, bouquet will be helpful for you. Are there any other questions for our speakers? All right, well, we just have one more minute. So um, I, oh, 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 wait, someone was saying, oh, no, okay. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to chime in in the last minute, but if not, then I will go ahead and thank our speakers for, um, for coming and for presenting this. This was really informative and I'm very excited uh, to be able to have this information. Um, we have some questions about whether we're, we can get the slides or recordings um, somewhere. Um, and so maybe 
we can see if that's going to be possible. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think all of us have posted our code on our GitHub pages, and I think we'll probably add links to the website um, after this is done. And then I do believe we'll be releasing a YouTube link eventually. Is that yes, right? The recordings will be processed and then posted. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Um, this is very great. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. So, uh, yeah. awesome. Thank you.